All right, folks, hello and welcome back to online English class. Hope you guys are doing well today. Today we're going to be completing our work uh, analyzing King Lear, looking specifically at the resolution of the character arcs of Lear, Cordelia, and Edgar. Okay, uh, before we do that, uh, let's go ahead and return uh, to the top of the week announcements and make sure uh, that we understand what's coming uh, before us. All right, so first of all, just uh, continue your discussion grade procedure duties. You know what to do. No more on that. All right. Um, uh, make sure that you're completing your OTNs on 4 and 5 and sending me that email confirming your completion of all of your OTNs uh, for King Lear by Friday at 3 p.m., okay? So that's kind of an all-in-one homework track. Uh, if you have not had time to complete your progress check because the website uh, it continues to be faulty, uh, don't stress out about it. Don't worry. Uh, just submit uh, your progress check whenever you have time. I'm sure the website will uh, be back up uh, sooner or later. Uh, when it is, check it. Log on. Uh, uh, write it at your leisure, submit it to me, and I'll grade it um, as if you had turned it in on time, okay? It's not your fault that the website is faulty. Uh, aside from that, I'm going to be giving you a prompt for your Unit 6 essay test at the end of today's lecture, all right? Uh, that uh, uh, prompt is going to also be available on RINWEB uh, so that you can download it uh, and you can begin your work collecting um, uh, evidence to support your interpretive argument about the meaning of the play as a whole, okay? Uh, so, uh, just send me that email, make sure that you've uh, completed your work on Lear, uh, make sure you're continuing your work on quarter four, uh, make sure that you're wrapping up your MWE for the road, uh, and aside from that, all right, you should be good to go. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and return uh, to OTN4. Okay, clearly we've already uh, spent some time uh, uh, giving a kind of overview of what happens in the play uh, today. Uh, we are going to continue our work analyzing how the uh, characters in this portion of the narrative are developed, okay, how their, their arcs resolve as character arcs are supposed to do in the resolution of a plot. All right, uh, so to briefly look back at yesterday, all right, uh, or perhaps not so briefly, all right, so, 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 so spend some time with me as I sort of build a bridge uh, into our analysis today, all right? So Reagan, Goneril, and Edmund's character arcs, all right, in my view, uh, uh, help articulate Shakespeare's view of the world or understanding uh, or impression that he's driving at uh, that human beings bear uh, kind of essential moral responsibility. Now, the implications of that statement are uh, uh, philosophically and also theologically much wider uh, than you might first think. Okay, so let me unpack that, right? Uh, those moral responsibilities are not just as the existentialist, uh, namely like Edmund, right, who believes that he is the master of his own existence, that, that he is not compelled to do anything, but rather that he is, in an abject sense, completely free, in an existentialist sense, completely at liberty to make meaning, to make his own reality, to make his own truth, okay? But in, uh, okay, in, uh, he, Edmund, his worldview is wrong, okay? Shakespeare seems to uh, posit. Goneril and Reagan, their moral licentiousness is wrong, all right? Rather, human beings, Shakespeare seems to posit, have a kind of essential, endowed, moral sense that is generally revealed and compels them to treat other human beings with love and respect. It's part of their identity as humans, all right? So, this asserts uh, or uh, uh, offers a kind of essence to a human being that implies a heavenly conscious, a God, that would have to institute that essence, all right? So in other words, anything with an essence, uh, uh, for, for something to have an essence, it has to be instilled. It has to be, uh, it has to be given that essence, all right? Uh, otherwise, if it wasn't given an essence, then it would be the master of its own essence. Its essence would be up to its own choosing, as the existentialist would argue. Okay, so Shakespeare says not only is that view of the world incorrect, a kind of deception that will betray you and that ultimately will lead to a kind of horrifying life in which your basic relational, uh, your, your, your desires for basic relationship to experience love ultimately come up against those desires, those wills to power and those wills to pleasure, those wills to cruelty, that, that will to exploitation right, 
uh, that those things ultimately are deceptive. Those things are manipulative. That that freedom is not, that, 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 that a life lived in pursuit of power, the cost of that life is loneliness. And that loneliness is horrifying. That, that uh, solitude is horrifying, okay, uh, in the final sense. It is not what you are naturally created for. It's not uh, in alignment with your essence, okay? And believing that it is ultimately your essence is to believe a kind of deception that will betray you. It is to embrace a kind of worldly, abject, materialistic approach to your life and your being that is not true and that will lead to your undoing. All right, that's dramatized for us in Reagan, Goneril, and Edmund. You guys tracking that? Okay, Shakespeare also uh, uh, posits, all right, that this essential human character, what it means to be human, all right, uh, in its most basic or essential sense, is also not as the naturalist would posit, so think like Edith Wharton, right? So not like the naturalist would posit, uh, a, a collection of instinctual responses to external environmental stimulus, okay? So if that was the essence of the human being, then very similar to the existentialist worldview, but derivative in some significant ways, all right, the naturalist would also posit that the human being is not inherently or naturally a moral creature and therefore does not have moral compulsions, okay? Uh, but rather, they are simply bound to, like all other beasts, like all other organisms, like viruses, like bacteria, like all living entities, okay? Think about uh, the living things in the root cellar in Theodore Roth's poem. All living things, including the human, not as distinct from, but including the human, are impelled, all right, compelled to seek after survival in an amoral quest, all right? So Shakespeare also says that's not true. That doesn't align with, uh, with, with the essence of humanity either. Rather, a human has been, unlike all the other beasts of the field, and unlike Wharton posits uh, in Ethan Frome, rather, the human being has been created, designed to try and live a kind of morally coherent life. And that when a person has one, when a person experiences love and respect, Okay, when a person gets that relationally, that they are at peace with their nature, that they are living, uh, if that individual is sane, okay, so obviously apart from certain forms of mental illness that, that make you not care about this, these kinds of things like psychopathy or sociopathy, uh, right? Um, uh, the sane human being who is, who is, who is uh, in tune with his essence uh, wants to live a morally coherent life, okay? So that se Shakespeare seems to defy both of those worldviews, all right? The existentialist and also the naturalist worldview, okay? So that would imply, all right, that if a human being is indeed essentially and intrinsically moral, designed, made, created, okay, uh, to, to pursue a kind of uh, 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 moral existence, all right, uh, that they are not bestial, then something, someone instilled that creature with those desires. Some supernatural, powerful, creative force. If you're a Christian, you call this supernatural, powerful, creative force God, okay? Uh, 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 if you're a deist, you call it God, but you mean something different. If you're a Muslim, you call it Allah, uh, God, but you mean something different. All right, uh, but if that creative force governs the universe, all right, that, that same powerful creative force that instills essences, instilled an essentially moral sense in you, all right, why are Goneril, Reagan, and Edmund's deaths riddled with inconsistent uh, applications of that law? Where is God, in a simple word? Where are the gods? Uh, if they are indeed just, if they are indeed powerful, if they are indeed those that instilled that moral sense in their creatures, then what, where are they uh, in the, the fifth act of Lear? And indeed, 
uh, in life in general. Okay, this is uh, very simply uh, the question the, uh, uh, that is uh, often called in in uh, uh, apologetics the problem of evil. Okay, the the question of the problem of evil. Okay. So this existential question is probed further in the resolution of Edgar, Lear, Cordelia, and Kent's character arcs, okay? And very similar to Goneril, Reagan, and Edmund's resolutions, there is a kind of measure of justice, but not a full measure, which is troubling, all right? Uh, which is evidence of the brokenness of the world uh, that we inhabit, all right? So first, let's consider Edgar, okay? What happens to Edgar uh, in the end uh, uh, of the play? Well, he shows up in Act 5, Scene 3. Uh, he confronts his, uh, 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 he confronts his immoral, uh, wicked brother Edmund, uh, and he, he claims that Edmund has been false to his gods, false to the, uh, the, the individuals around him, uh, false to thy gods, thy brother and thy father, conspiratant against the high illustrious prince, and from the extremists upward of thy head to the descent and dust below thy foot, a most toad-spotted traitor. Okay, so Edgar's condemnation of Edmund implies a kind of optimistic belief uh, in the fact that gods govern the world and that a person uh, and, and those gods require an individual to, to be uh, honest, all right? Uh, and, and, and Edgar believes this, right? Uh, and, and in fact, uh, there is a kind of measure of justice uh, in Edgar and Edmund's relationship that is offered to us or given to us in Act 5. Edgar lives, right? Ed Edgar doesn't die, okay? Cordelia does, but Edgar doesn't. Edgar, Edgar wins, uh, Edgar dispenses, dispenses and dispatches justice on the head of Edmund, all right? Uh, and, and, in, and in the end, right, uh, uh, he, uh, Edgar affirms uh, this belief, all right, that the gods are just uh, and our pleasant vices makes instruments to plague us. In other words, individuals who have vices that they take pleasure in, like Edmund, end up being plagued by those vices, okay? So this is just an affirmation that Edgar believes that he lives in a, a morally coherent, just world governed by morally coherent, just gods, okay? But this belief, all right, doesn't, uh, it, this belief, uh, when taken, uh, when, when one takes the totality of the play into consideration, uh, this belief uh, does not fully reflect the reality that Edgar is uh, living in, okay? Uh, especially when compared with uh, the, the scene that is about to unfold before his very eyes in the next few minutes in which Cordelia's dead body, best of all the characters, right, uh, most unequivocally good of all the characters, is brought in uh, very much dead, all right? Uh, and, and her death is not only unjust but also accidental, right? Uh, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was not only an unjust commandment, but the commandment was taken back by Edmund as he attempted to do one last good thing, okay? So Edgar's victory in the end, like Edmund's defeat in the end, rings a bit hollow, all right? His belief in the just gods who govern a well-ordered world all right, is likened to a, a kind of blind optimism, all right, uh, uh, given the context. All right, so think about how Gloucester's character arc uh, 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 resolves, okay? Gloucester dies, and he has a very brief moment of reconciliation with Edgar, but once again, all right, the, in, the, the emphatic word here is brief, temporal, right? Gloucester is kind of resurrected by Edgar's mercy and grace, but that mercy and grace does not lead to a life of flourishing and communion, but rather, right, Edgar, uh, for about half an hour, uh, uh, tells his dad, he, he, he explains this uh, after he's defeated Edmund, he, he, he tells his dad who he is, and Gloucester kind of gives him his blessing and then dies, okay? Well, uh, that, that's all well and good, but it certainly is 
temporal. It's only temporary. Okay? Uh, again, troubling. Troubling. Right? Now, uh, let's, let's consider Lear's uh, character development. Okay? So, uh, Lear, very much like uh, all the other characters that we have here, uh, is is brought to a partial uh, 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 sort of justification. He is partially as he ought to be, but he is not completely uh, as he ought to be, just as the world is not completely as it ought to be. All right? Uh, uh, so Lear, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in Act 5, Scene 3, when they are brought in uh, by Edmund, Lear is indeed... Deeply humbled, all of the pride, all of the hubris, right, the, the Greek word for it, that animated Lear's character back in Act 1 is gone. He's been stripped of that. Life and reality have stripped Lear of his uh, uh, existential pride, the fact that he believed that he was in control of his existence. But notice what he, what, what he sort of resolves to do here. He wants to go away to prison and to live alone, singing like birds in the cage, all right? And when, uh, Cordelia, when you want my blessing, I'll kneel down and ask thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news, and we'll talk with them too, who loses and who wins, who's in, who's out, and take upon the mystery of things, as if we were God's spies, and will wear out in a walled prison packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Okay, uh, This is a very famous passage in the play, by the way, uh, and it is a statement of Lear's position of resignation. All right, He wants to go away to prison, All right, where he will literally and also kind of symbolically be barred from acting, barred from uh, from engaging in uh, uh, life, right? Civic life, uh, social uh, life. He he just kind of wants to watch it all happen uh, and, and understands uh, it's all kind of a joke, anyways, uh, and embraces this kind of uh, 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 absurdist uh, approach to life, where it's all just a big joke. It's all just a big game. Right, uh, like that, like like that famous show, Game of Thrones. Right, it's all just kind of a Game of Thrones. We'll just watch it happen. Uh, we'll we'll just watch it unfold, uh, and then uh, we'll die. We'll wear out. Well, this resignation is not obedience to the law of love because obedience to the law of love requires guess what? Action. All right, it requires activity. It requires uh, obedience is an act. It is always an act, an act of the will. Uh, that requires one to incarnate love to other people, not sit sequestered away in a prison. Uh, so yes, Lear is humbled, okay? But is he, uh, has he been brought to a clear understanding of that which he has been, is morally compelled to do? Not exactly. So once again, the redeeming power of Cordelia's love has limits, uh, it's it, 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 Lear has regained a measure of his sanity, okay? But has he been fully reconciled to a full understanding of his essential compulsions, his essential duties as a, as a human being, as a man? No. Cordelia, uh, Cordelia's love doesn't have that kind of power, it would seem, okay? Uh, and later in Act 5, Scene 3, Okay, uh, to further or to deepen this impression, right, when Lear uh, enters uh, with the body of Cordelia in his hands, right, how, how, oh, you men of stones, had I uh, your tongue and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. She's gone forever. I know when one is dead and when one lives, she's dead as earth. All right, uh, 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 this articulation of a kind of dead uh, or meaningless world, a heartless world. Okay, lend me a looking glass. If that her breath will mist or stain the stone, why then she lives? Okay, Kent asks a very important existential question when confronted with this horrible vision of injustice. Is this the promised end? Is this what all of my work was leading to? This uh, is this the right 
uh, 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 sort of recompense? Is this the payment of all of my faithful and loyal service? Okay, is this the promised end? Is this how life, is this what it comes to? Okay, uh, and then Lear, all right, uh, 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 heartbroken at the aspect of his dead daughter, okay, seems to begin to drift back where? Well, insanity, all right? Uh, he says she lives, the feather stirs, okay? So he's holding like a feather in front of uh, 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 her mouth, seeing if she's breathing, okay? Um, the feather is not stirring, all right? She is not breathing. She is dead, uh, but he's convinced himself in his own mind that she is still alive. Uh, and uh, because she's still alive, he says it redeems all sorrows, okay? Everything bad, everything sad is made untrue. Cordelia is alive, okay? Uh, she has uh, overcome this uh, sort of uh, example of injustice, right? Uh, and, and Lear dies with dull sight, Okay, he, he, look, look, no, notice his, re, uh, uh, his re reunion with his faithful servant, Kent. Okay, are you not Kent? Okay, Kent's like, yeah, it's me. Uh, where is your servant, Caius? Lear, he's a good fellow, I can tell you that. He'll strike and quickly too. And then finally, right, he's dead and rotten. <laughs> okay, like in other words, uh, Caius was uh, Kent's undercover name or disguise name. Uh, uh, Lear doesn't fully understand who Kent is when he's looking at him. He's sort of seeing uh, him uh, 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 through the eyes of, of uh, a little bit of insanity. He's not quite quite clear who he's talking to. Uh, and then uh, when 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 asked about the existence of the service K, uh, servant Caius, who was Kent, Kent is asking that to say like, "Hey, you remember that guy? That was me, right?" Uh, Lear's like, "Yeah, he was a good guy, but he's dead now." Uh, uh, Kent, no, my good lord. Uh, I am the very man. I'll see that straight. In other words, I'll try and understand that, okay? Um, so uh, ultimately, Lear's reunion, even with Kent, is partial, uh, unsatisfactory, okay? Um, uh, it, it, isn't, uh, uh, it isn't lucid, right? Uh, and then finally, Lear dies uh, uh, coming to terms with the fact that his, his fool is dead, right? His, uh, the fool has been hanged. It's pretty awful, right? He kind of drifts off screen and then ends up being dead. He right? must have been killed by Reagan's forces or uh, Goneril's forces or uh, so, somebody, right? Somebody hung the fool and, and he dies believing that uh, uh, Cordelia might still be alive. Okay, look on her lip. L look, her lips. Look there, look there, right? Desperately uh, 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 hoping that Cordelia is still alive, uh, uh, not uh, in full reconciliation with reality. That reality is simply for Lear too much to bear. Okay, so once again, uh, Lear's entire character arc, which has been devoted to realigning him with reality uh, and bringing him back from the cliff uh, of his own insanity, uh, 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 reconciling him with an accurate understanding of the world around him was partial, okay? It was partial. Uh, it was incomplete. It was insufficient, in other words. Okay? Uh, and then finally, right, uh, uh, Cordelia. What about Cordelia? Okay? Uh, Cordelia is unwaveringly uh, committed to the good. All right? Even after she is arrested by Edmund in Act 5, uh, she continues, unlike Lear, uh, to, to not uh, uh, simply embrace uh, resignation and go away to prison and and not and quit fighting. She wants to confront Goneril and Reagan. She wants to continue to obey the law of love and to pursue justice. Okay, she is unwaveringly good, and she okay is killed. Uh, importantly, she uh, is killed. Her redeeming power, the embodiment of the fruit of living in accordance with one's compulsion to to love. She is that embodiment alongside Edgar who, by the way, remember, he lives, Cordelia dies. Where is the justice there? Okay, it, I'll give you a hint. It, it's, it, there isn't, or it's partial, right? It's, it's kind of just, just for Edgar, deeply unjust for Cordelia, okay? Uh, her, her, uh, her redeeming power is incomplete. 
all right? Uh, it, it's passing. It's temporal. Uh, and even in retrospect, very much like uh, uh, Edgar's best attempts to, to do that which is good and Lear's best attempts to understand and do what is good and Gloucester's best attempts to do what is good and Kent's best attempts to do what is good as he unflaggingly follows and serves the, the, the king, King Lear, but a, a flawed king in a flawed kingdom, in a flawed world. Even in retrospect, Cordelia's best attempts to do what is good, which began all the way back in Act 1, in which she unflaggingly was committed to the truth, but in such a way that incurred deep chaos and suffering, right? If Cordelia could have negotiated this scene a little bit better, which if we're going to look at this critically, right, Cordelia could have handled this better. I understand that it reveals her idealism. I understand that it reveals her unflagging commitment to be honest and loving and just and true. But uh, her negotiation of the situation does indeed leave Lear in the hands of Goneril and Reagan. And she knows that Goneril and Reagan are bad news. And she does it anyways. In other words, very much like Kent, very much like Edgar, very much like Lear, very much like Gloucester, even Cordelia, the best character in the narrative, falls short okay, as her pursuit of the good okay, in this fallen world is not unequivocally good. right? It isn't done in a perfect way. Okay? Uh, though admirable. Right? These characters are deeply admirable. Right? Uh, their attempts to do what is good, they are not enough. And they are uh, continually and at every turn, okay, geniusly characterized by the plotting of Shakespeare, riddled with constant miscalculation. All right? uh, 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 and those miscalculations spiral beneath each decision. Okay? So... What in the world does all of this mean? Why all of this partial justice? Okay, What is Shakespeare dramatizing? What is he trying to say about what it means to be human on its most basic, essential level? What is he saying about what it means to be human in the world, this environment that we inhabit? What is Shakespeare saying about what it means to exist without access to the revelation of a God and a grander narrative that makes sense out of the seeming chaos of the world, the, partial ju the partially just world that we inhabit? Okay. Well, I'm not going to answer that, although I'd love to. All right, I could go on. Uh, and on, but I will not. What I'm going to do instead uh, is ask you a question, all right? And that question is, what is, in your view, in your view, this is an argument in the end, what, in your view, is the central thematic impression of King Lear? Another way of saying that is, what does this play mean? You can hack this uh, in a variety of different ways. You can go at this question in a variety of different ways. Okay, uh, It is intentionally open-ended. What does this play mean? And uh, in order to give you some kind of guidance, uh, I just want you to select one character. Okay, One character whose experiences you will analyze uh, and that you will uh, you'll use their character arc uh, uh, in order to voice the thematic impression that you are positing that Shakespeare has made in this play. All right. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, studying this play. This is the kind of the last uh, 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 piece of literature that um, I will get the opportunity to teach you. Beyond this, we're, we're, we're going to be reviewing and talking about composition stuff. Uh, uh, I, I love this play. Uh, I love you guys uh, uh, deeply. And, and as always, right, uh, I am teaching this from a, uh, a, a deeply Christian bias. I want you to see, uh, above all things, uh, the, 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 the great need uh, of the gospel, the great need 
of revelation, the great need of a kind of divine intervention that cuts through uh, the fallen world that we have chosen for ourselves, that reflect uh, our very will uh, to control the environment that we live in, our willy-nilly, wanton uh, 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 disobedience uh, and ignorance of the thing that we have been create the things that we have been created to do, uh, uh, the consequences of that, and the deep longing for reconciliation and redemption uh, that is spoken of in this play. Uh, if you did not see that, all right, I'd like to know what you did, all right? I'd like to know what you saw in this play. Uh, that's the point of the test, all right? Uh, I'm going to be measuring both your reflection on the play and also uh, your ability to use character analysis to substantiate uh, that impression. All right, uh, have a great day and a great weekend. Hope you are doing well.